Welcome to topics 2.4 and 2.5, plasma membranes and membrane permeability. Prioritizing cell parts by importance would be a difficult task. After all, because each cell part has a responsibility or a set of responsibilities, lacking any given part would mean that those responsibilities are not accomplished. But there is one cell part that does have a particularly critical role because it establishes the boundary between the external environment and the internal, the cell membrane. The cell membrane is also responsible for regulating what enters and exits the cell, how cells interact with one another, and how cells respond to proteins and chemical messengers on the outside of the cell. Because a later video is going to explore cell membranes transport responsibilities, this video is only going to address membrane structure and its primary function, which is regulating the passage of materials through it. This characteristic function is referred to as selective or semi-permeability. All cells, be they eukaryotic, animal, plant, or fungal, or prokaryotic cells, have a cell membrane. There are a variety of molecules that are necessary for the construction of a cell membrane, but the most numerous of them is the phospholipid. A special kind of fat molecule, phospholipids are amphiphilic, which means they have a region that is polar and a region that is nonpolar. The polar region, called the hydrophilic head, is able to interact with water because of the charged phosphate portion. Some phospholipids are modified with an additional charged group, like the choline shown in this one. The glycerol portion of the head is the link to the two hydrophobic tails that cannot interact with water. Other than the phospholipids, there are a variety of other molecules that are embedded in or attached to the cell's membrane. They include proteins that pass all the way through the membrane, called transmembrane or integral proteins, as well as peripheral proteins that are attached to them. Carbohydrates can be found attached to some of those proteins, called glycoproteins, or they can be attached to lipids, forming glycolipids. A special component of the cell membrane that influences how permeable the membrane is, is cholesterol. That will be explored in more detail in a few moments. On both the inside and outside of the cell, there are protein fibers that attach to the cell's membrane. On the inside is the cytoskeleton that acts as a scaffolding to help maintain the cell's shape. And on the outside is the extracellular matrix that is responsible for connecting cells to one another. Scientists refer to our understanding of the construction of cell membranes as the fluid mosaic model. This tells us that the membrane itself is flexible, the components within it can move around, and that the composition includes multiple parts which the cell can modify or adjust. Because of the chemical properties of a phospholipid, when placed in water, they behave in very predictable ways. In small quantities, and usually only if the phospholipids have a single fatty acid tail, they form spherical structures called micelles. As you can see in this model, the phospholipids in the micelles have arranged themselves spontaneously in a manner that orients the hydrophobic tails inward, away from water, and the charged hydrophilic heads are in contact with water. With greater quantities of phospholipids, and depending on other environmental factors like pH and temperature, they will form a bilayer. The liposome in this model illustrates the result. At the very interior of the liposome would be an aqueous environment, again in contact with the charged hydrophilic heads, and the same is true for the aqueous exterior environment. For any of these structures, we would find very little to no water in the regions where the hydrophobic tails are present. Because the bilayer establishes a boundary between an internal and external environment, 
the cell's contents as well as the environmental conditions within the cell are kept separate from the external environment. This model here, showing a portion of a phospholipid bilayer, illustrates regions of the bilayer that would be fully hydrated, partially hydrated, and fully dehydrated relative to each part of the bilayer and the phospholipids that comprise it. Because of water potential and osmotic pressure, topics covered in another video, water can travel directly through the membrane, but does so more readily through transport proteins called aquaporins. This graphic helps to make that point. We can observe on both sides of this bilayer an incalculable number of water molecules. The phospholipid bilayer itself, with its yellow color-coded phospholipid heads and green color-coded phospholipid tails, has a blue color-coded aquaporin for the transport of water molecules. Phospholipid bilayer built structures can fuse together, sharing their contents. This is a fundamental process in the digestion of materials that a cell engulfs. The bilayers themselves can also form pores through which substances can pass. Depending on how the phospholipids around the pore are oriented, it may form a hydrophobic pore for the transport of hydrophobic substances, or a hydrophilic pore for the transport of hydrophilic substances. There are three main factors that influence how fluid a cell's membrane is. The first and probably most intuitive is temperature. Just like any fat, an increase in temperature would make the membrane more fluid and a decrease in temperature would make it less fluid. Lowering the temperature enough, in fact, could cause the membrane to solidify. The second factor is fatty acid composition. Recall that each phospholipid possesses two fatty acid tails. Fatty acids are long chains of carbon atoms with hydrogen atoms attached to them. If all of the carbons are connected through single covalent bonds, we define that fatty acid as saturated. On the other hand, if there's at least one double covalent bond in the chain, the fatty acid is unsaturated. Saturated fatty acids are relatively linear, whereas unsaturated fatty acids have a bend in them. Because unsaturated fatty acids have bends or kinks in them, they are unable to be tightly packed together, which allows for more fluidity in the cell's membrane. Saturated tails, on the other hand, because they're relatively linear and packed tightly together, make the cell membrane less fluid or more viscous. Generally, however, cell membranes typically have a variety of phospholipids to achieve just the right balance of fluidity. Additionally, cells can alter the composition of phospholipids in their membrane in response to changing environmental conditions. With decreasing or low environmental temperatures, cells increase the proportion of phospholipids with unsaturated tails to prevent the membrane from solidifying at those low temperatures. And if environmental temperatures increase, cell membrane composition is adjusted to contain more saturated fatty acid tails to prevent the membrane from becoming too fluid. A final major factor in influencing the fluidity of a membrane is the presence of cholesterol. Cholesterol is perhaps best known as a component of one's diet, too much of which could present long-term health problems. In fact, Cholesterol in animal cells is a very important lipid-based steroid involved with chemical cell-to-cell -cell communication, transport of certain substances within and between cells, and is a chemical precursor to a number of other molecules, including estrogen, testosterone, cortisol, and vitamin D, for example. As a major component of a cell's membrane, it is responsible for restricting the movement of phospholipids, thereby decreasing fluidity at moderate temperatures, and at cooler temperatures, it disallows phospholipids from packing tightly together, preventing the membrane from solidifying. So what's the relationship between fluidity of a membrane and the membrane's primary function? 
membrane fluidity and membrane permeability are directly proportional. The more fluid the membrane is, the greater permeability it has, allowing more substances to pass through it and vice versa. A cell membrane that is inappropriately permeable would allow in unnecessary or perhaps harmful substances, while at the same time allowing to escape those substances that cells require in order to function. Membrane permeability does vary based on the cell type in question, but for any particular cell type, think of Goldilocks. This membrane is too fluid. This membrane is too viscous. But this membrane is just right. So now that we know how the cell membrane is constructed and how it influences selective permeability, what kinds of molecules are free to pass through the membrane and what kinds aren't? Two main factors determine whether or not a molecule can pass through the cell membrane directly. Solubility in water and molecule size. Some polar molecules can travel through the core of the membrane if they're small enough. But large polar molecules and anything with a charge, like sodium or calcium ions, are restricted from traveling directly through the membrane. Instead, they require assistance from transport proteins, whose functions are studied in a subsequent video. Gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide, as well as hydrophobic molecules, can pass directly through the membrane. This is true because they can pass through the hydrophobic, water-free core of the membrane. In addition to cell membranes, some cells, like those of plants, fungi, and bacteria, have an additional boundary between the internal cellular environment and the external. That boundary is the cell wall. Unlike the cell membrane's lipid composition, cell walls are constructed of complex carbohydrates. In plants, that carbohydrate is cellulose, chitin in fungi, and peptidoglycans in bacteria. The cell walls serve a primary function of providing physical support for the cell. Plant Fungal and bacterial cell membranes carry the bulk of responsibility for regulating passage, but cell walls are selectively permeable for some substances. The single most important factor in whether or not a substance can pass through the cell wall is if it's small enough to do so. That wraps up our look into cell membranes and their construction and function. Thank you for watching, and as always, take care.